Okay, I think it's about time for us to get started here with uh, church history. My name is Johnny White. Um, I am pastor of Redeeming Grace Church in Milton, Florida, also uh, dean of Ecclesia Seminary. Um, Ecclesia is designed to provide seminary training for uh, men who do not have access to it otherwise, in other words, who can't um, move and go away to a seminary. Um, don't have the funds to afford seminary education, um, but we've put everything online, continuing to put things online and uh, provide uh, that training through those means. Primarily design, <clears throat> although we've had a number of North American uh, students, a great number, uh, who are interested, is primarily designed for uh, training men overseas. There's a tremendous need because of lack of theological training in other lands, so, so that's the primary design of it, to get that theological training uh, around the world, really. Uh, so that's part of the design of this as well, right? So that we can send forth men uh, with training to train others as they go and, and plant churches and evangelize around the world. So this topic is church history. And it's, it's a bit frustrating. I, I'll, I'll just confess, I'm frustrated right now. And, and the frustration is that we've got 2,000 years plus of church history to cover in 12 hours. And um, it's, it's just not feasible, right? So, so this is going to be just kind of skipping across the surface uh, as we move through this. But hopefully it, there, there's enough there um, to, to benefit us. And, and hopefully there'll be enough to, to whet your appetite for more and, and that this just becomes continuous training to you as you incorporate learning about church history. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. Uh, the book um, that uh, <clears throat> I would like to recommend uh, to you and require of those who are, are uh, going through this for certification uh, there, there's a number of, of good church history books, and, and all of them are typically pretty thick. So, there's, I mean, it's 2,000 years, right? So this is, this is difficult. Um, <clears throat> but this is a very readable one. It's Church History in Plain Language by Bruce Shelley. And um, so he writes very well, uh, very readable. And uh, so I want to encourage you uh, to, to get this and read it if you can. And um, it, I think it will provide more than what I'm able to share with you. And it will also help you to understand, uh, even as we, we go through this, some of, some of what I'm saying. Uh, you'll be able to see this. So let me put this aside. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, talk about church history, do uh, an introduction, really, to church history today. And uh, what we want to begin with is this whole idea of what church history is. Let me just say at the outset that it's, it's important, church history, or Christian history sometimes it's called, same thing, it's important to know and understand because it is foundationally about Jesus Christ. Okay. So as, as Christians, we want to know about Christ, and that's what this is, as we study church history, we're studying Jesus Christ and the founding of his church by himself. Okay, he, he founds his own church. He begins his church. And then the spread of that. So we have the four Gospels. We have the life of Jesus, right? And then we have the book of Acts, which is the continuing acts of Jesus through the early church. And then it stops, the canon is closed, and uh, we'll talk about that, not tonight, but uh, another time. The, the canon is closed, so we have the scripture completed, but we still have things happening, right? We still have God working. He hasn't stopped working. We still have Christ uh, building his church, and so for 2,000 years that's been going on. So we can look back and we can, we can see God at work in the life of his church. So, so this, that makes this, this very important to us. Now, again, this is about Jesus Christ. I mean, who is the most important person in history, in human history? And um, some would say one person, some another, but I think that uh, 
um, at least in the Western world, um, most of us would say that it's Jesus Christ. Who is the person to change the world the most? It's Jesus Christ. And even from a secular viewpoint, you can look at this historically and see that this is the case. This is, this is dramatic, what Jesus Christ accomplished. Even, even our division of time, which some are trying to do away with now in our secularized world, but between B.C. before Christ and A.D., the, the coming of Christ, divides that time. It was some years later, look back, putting calendar together, and, and they determined, okay, we'll, we'll measure time from before Christ to um, A.D. is actually, it's not after the death of Christ, it's Annus Domini, in the year of the Lord. So everything from the time of Christ's coming is measured by the year of the Lord. And so you'll even see the ancient documents, or in even in recent history, the, some of our documents in the Western world, in America, okay, when they date it, it'll say, in the year of the Lord, you know, 1584, whatever it might be, 1776, whatever, in the year of the Lord. Uh, that's the measurement of time. So we have, have this 2,000 years of church history, and, and typically it's divided into some very broad uh, time periods. There is the early church history, which uh, is about the first four to 600 years, is usually how it's measured. And then there's what's called the medieval, which really means the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages between the early church and the, the modern church history. So that basically goes from, uh, according to who's dividing it, you know, from about four to 600 up to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. And so then that is now called the modern church history. So we've got these, these three broad categories. But, but where to begin? Where to begin talking about this? Well, some begin the study of church history with the death of the apostles. Okay? The early church is done with, basically, so now we begin the, the study of, of church history. Others go back to the book of Acts, because there we see um, um, the history of the early church taking place in that time period. Some will point us back to the Old Testament, because there, uh, some would argue, are the beginnings of the church, the Old Testament church, as, as they would call it. But of course, it's even possible to go back further into the mind of God, because the Bible talks about the decrees of God uh, before the foundation of the world. So we can go back to the mind of God. He's got all this planned out. So, so we could go back all this. So, so the first issue we come up with in this is, is where do we even start? What, what should we start with? And I think the, the place to begin is, the, at least will begin, with Jesus since he's the one that founded the church. So we start with him and, and move from there. So let's define this. What is church history? And here's a definition for you. It's kind of a working definition for us. Church history is the study of Christianity in the historical development and in its relation to human society. It includes the study of events and people in relation to Christianity. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. We look at Christianity, but of course also it impacts the society around us. And, so we ha and, and the society around us affects us, right? The culture, it's just kind of this dialogue that's going back and forth. Both affect one another. And that's something we need to understand as we, we move through uh, this. There are some, some difficulties with teaching church history. And this is some of the frustration that, again, I'm, I'm going to express my frustration to you. Okay, this is, this is some of it. Okay, how, how to even do this? Because there are some, some limitations uh, which we have. There, there are limitations of the historian himself. And we could all be historians, right? I'm not just talking in a scholarly way, in an official way, but we should all be historians in, in the study of history. Well, we are born in and we live in a certain time and place. Okay, again, God's plan. Why were you born where you were? Why do you live where you are? Well, it's, it's God's plan and it's His providence and He's brought that about. Well, this means that we have certain presuppositions 
built into us. We were raised in a certain way, in a certain culture, in a certain family. Uh, we were raised in the, in the Western world with Western culture. We weren't raised, um, I mean, I'm, I'm making general statements here, but uh, I think most of us were not raised in, a, in an Oriental setting with an Oriental mindset. Okay, so we, we have certain presuppositions in place. So we need to try to discover what those presuppositions are and, and admit that we have them, especially when we're looking at church history, and this will help us to do so. Um, another aspect of this, this limitations that we have in, in regard to being born in a certain time and place is that we've got to be careful when we're studying church history that we don't glorify certain aspects of church history that, that we happen to like. Okay, that fit with us and our setting that we're in. And we look back and we say, oh, yeah, I really like that. And so all of a sudden, that's a, that's a wonderful time in church history, and everything's just really great with that. Uh, well, church history is a history of saints and sinners, and of saints who sin. And, and when you begin studying church history, you find this to be the case. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. And we also need to recognize that whenever we're doing church history, whenever we're, we're studying church history, there's always an interpretation of the past. We can say this about history, period, right? And that's what you need to understand. When, when people are presenting history to us, when they're teaching the history, when you're, you know, you're, re, you're watching documentaries, whatever it is, you're reading history, whatever, that's an interpretation. They are interpreting for you history. That's what we have to do. We're forced to do that. There's no way to get around that. You just don't just present facts. There's not just bare facts. There's always interpreted facts. There's always interpreted history. So, so that's something to keep in mind as you read any kind of history book or you're taught history in any form or fashion. So, so there's limitations in, in regard to where we are born and, and where we live. Um, also, in regard to this, God has providentially exposed us to certain things. And so there's, that means there's some things we're not exposed to. There's some things we don't know. And, there, and there's some things that we are exposed to by His, His providence. So we can only know so much, right? We, we only know so much, and we have so much more to know and to discover. We only have access to so many sources. Some of those sources are good, some of them are bad. There's good sources and there are bad sources for history, so, so we need to understand the nature of the sources. So there are limitations of the historian. There are also, um, there's also the difficulty of attempting to make church history interesting. Okay. Um, I mean, this is history, right? And a lot of people, I think most people, hate history. Now, they don't. They don't like the study of history, and um, Christian history can be difficult because many people are not interested in history itself. They view history as boring. It's filled with facts, dates. Now that's why I had to learn in school facts and dates, memorize all these things. What does that mean? It just doesn't. It's just boring stuff. But we need to understand church history is always a dialogue. It's a dialogue that is taking place. We are asking questions of the past. And the past is critiquing us. This is why it's so important. We are dialoguing with people that have gone before us. People made in the image of God. And in many cases, especially with church sisters, we're looking at, hopefully, redeemed by Christ's blood. And we are we are asking them questions when we study church history. And they are, in a sense, speaking back to us as we, not in some mystical way, I'm not meaning that, but when we're reading the documents and we're reading the accounts, they're, they're speaking to us and they're critiquing us when they do this. This, this can be a very humbling thing for us. Um, so, so I hope that, that's, that it's interesting as, as we look at, at that. And then there's always the problem of determining what level to, to teach upon. It's sometimes difficult for the person presenting the material to, uh, 
determine what level to teach upon, how deep to go, uh, how many facts to give, what to emphasize. Uh, all of these things are, are difficult because there's this so much here. It is astounding how much there is in church history. And we're discovering more and more. And as you go along and you, you read, I mean, I, I find this interesting. I, I'll read some of the, I always like to read, if possible, the, the original sources, the primary source, because then it's not so much an interpretation for somebody else. You get to interpret yourself what this person said. But even with some of these ancient documents, you're reading some of the, like the church fathers and so forth, and they're quoting somebody else. It's not like their, their thought is original at this point. They're quoting somebody else, and, and perhaps the source is there. We've discovered the source. We know. And then we can go and re we can read this no name. You know, that this well-known church father is quoting. And we've never heard of this guy. He's quoting or whatever. And we can go and there's a source that is there, a, a new rich source of a person who wrote this stuff or spoke about this. And it was recorded, written down. And, and so there's, there's always these trails. You can go down and you can discover these, these new things. So, um, so it's, it's, it's important that we... Look at church history because there is so much that we can learn from it. Which brings us to our next topic, indeed the importance of, of church history. And here I'm really asking the question of why, why should we study church history? Uh, so again, I'm, I'm still kind of, you're here, so you think it's important, but I'm still trying to sell you on it a little bit. Okay, I still want you to really embrace this Go deeper with it and go further with it than, than I could ever give to you. Okay, why study history or church history? Well, there's, there's many reasons. One is because of the importance of redemptive history. And it is because of the importance of redemptive history that we are commanded by God to study it. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 7 says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Uh, and, you, and you look at this. This is all through the scripture, right? Look back to the past. Hear what your fathers have said to you. Learn from those who have gone before. And this is especially true in regard to redemptive history. It's not, again, they weren't just saying... Okay, learn from your ancestors about the, the dates and the names of people and when this occurred and so forth. It was about God working in their lives. God's redemptive work. That's what is so important that we, we learn about. So Christianity is a historical religion, right? I mean, it looks to the past. Our salvation is based on the past event, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's a historical event. So yes, I mean, in our day and age where everything is about modern experience and the modern day in which we live and the, the glory of the moment, the experience of the moment, Christianity comes along and says, wait a minute, look back. Look back to the one who died on the cross. This is the foundation of everything that we believe. Because of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the Word becoming flesh in time, as, as John presents it to us in his Gospel, Christianity is historically oriented. The coming of Christ is situated in history. It is a historical event. The church is founded in history. And it progresses throughout history. It's historically oriented. So because of the importance of redemptive history, and, be, and it is because of its importance that we are then commanded by the Word of God to, to study it. Second, it helps us to mature in our understanding and helps us to have the proper perspective. Philip Melanchthon who was a friend and disciple of Martin Luther, a great Protestant reformer, said, Human life without knowledge of history is nothing other than a perpetual childhood, nay, a permanent obscurity and darkness. 
Human life, without knowledge of history, is nothing other than a perpetual childhood. What do you say? One thing it helps us with is the truth of God. It helps us to avoid false teaching. It helps us to avoid false practice. Many of the beliefs, many of the practices, many of the groups that we think are new in our day and age are in fact simply repetition of what has been in the past. The great writer said there's nothing new under the sun. And it's true when it comes to church history. All of these things, we say, wow, this is a strange new belief. Study back in church history. You'll find it. You'll find it there. It's really quite amazing. The study of church history can also help us with our Bible study and theology because we're drawing on the wisdom of others. We're drawing on some very wise people. We're, we're drawing on the wisdom of the ages. And, and they're not always right, and so we have to be discerning. It's like we're not always right in our day and age, and personally, we're not. So, so we have to, to, to be discerning with that, but there's a, there's a lot of wisdom built up over 2,000 years. And so we can, we can look back and draw on their wisdom. And then the study of church history in regard to this maturity can also help bring unity to the church. And it can also help to bring a proper unity with the diversity that we understand that exists in, in God's new creation. So it helps us to mature. And third, it's important that we study church history because it gives us an understanding of the way in which God works in His creation and in His people. Everett Ferguson, who's a church historian, said, Those who profess to dislike history may as well profess to dislike people. What they really mean is that they dislike the externals, the framework of information. Such details are necessary to the telling of the story, but the real story itself is the people who were involved. And, and he says that he writes his church history from the perspective that church history is the story of the greatest community the world has ever known and the greatest movement in world history. So this is what we're about when we study church history. So church history links us, us who are in the present. It's a link with the past so that we can then gain wisdom for our present day and have hope for the future plan of God. That's what we're doing when we're studying church history. Mark Noel, another church historian, put it this way. He said, the great decisions of the Christian past were made by people who sang and prayed with their fellow believers, who experienced the priceless nurture of regular worship and the disillusioning sorrows of interchurch conflict, and who often expounded at great length on the page or in public speech. To hear their voices is not just to offer window dressing, but to show that the great events of church history always involved real people, for whom regular worship, study of Scripture, participation in sacraments, and attention to preaching and teaching provided a foundation for what gets written up in books. So in other words, exactly what we do every Lord's Day, this is what he's saying was written up in the books of church history. We are joining ourselves with this incredible community, this great community, the greatest community and movement that there's ever been in history. Every Lord's Day. When we gather together, we are joining in that progression of God's sovereign and providential work. So with, with the study of church history, we, we become aware of our spiritual ancestry. We can look back and understand our different beliefs and practices in, in light of that. So it connects us to the past. And then uh, church history can also help us spiritually. I'm not sure if I've got this one on here. No, nope, don't. So this is, this is a freebie for you. Uh, it can help us spiritually. It can bring motivation to us to live a godly life. So when we hear about Christians in the past that have lived sacrificial lives, we tend to desire to be like them in that regard. That motivates us to be sacrificial like them. So we read about William Carey, 
his incredible sacrifices. What, a, what an incredible story. David Brainerd, uh, Jonathan Edwards, um, other Christian martyrs. Um, I'm going to try to get to some of them today. I don't know if we'll do it, but if not, we'll pick up next time. But the, the martyrs, um, the missionaries, uh, great leaders and pastors. This, we read about these, and it, it motivates us to be more like them. You know, it can also bring humility to us. And we look at uh, what, what has happened in the past, and we see God's incredible working, and we see He's worked all these ways with these incredible people. And so it humbles us that He has made us a part of this. Um, so it brings humility. It should also bring gratitude to us. We, we should be thankful to the Lord for what He has done. Um, let me give you an, another quote from a, from a church story, and I think this is, I alluded to this earlier, but I, I think we need to keep this in mind, and this is what humbles us as well. I think, in, for our present life as well, as we look at other Christians and we relate to other Christians, but, but as we look back in history, this is, I think, what we, we find. This is what he said. He said, the church's history is often a sordid, disgusting tale. Once students push beyond sanitized versions of Christian history to realistic study, it is clear that self-seeking, rebellion, despotism, pettiness, indolence, cowardice, murder, though dignified with God talk, and the lust for power, along with all other lusts, have flourished in the church almost as ignobly as in the world at large. A study of church history can be an eye-opener. The heroes of the faith usually have feet of clay. The golden ages of the past usually turn out to be tarnished if they are examined closely enough. Crowding around the heroes of the faith are a lot of villains, and some of them look an awful lot like the heroes. What it shows is a divine patience broader than any human impatience, a divine forgiveness more powerful than any human offense, and a divine grace deeper than our human sin. So that's what I want us to keep in mind as we move in this. We're looking at church history, and we're seeing all these people, these human beings, these sinners. But what we're really looking at is God working in people's lives. The redemptive history of God. And God is an incredibly gracious, forgiving, and patient God. And that should bring us great hope as well. So, what, we, what I want to really begin with is the history of the church in the times of Jesus and the apostles. So what we have is the centrality of Christ to history. I've already mentioned this. Um, Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. All you got to do is read Matthew chapter 1, and you will see that this is the case. He was the beginning of a new creation. He is the new Adam, Romans chapter 5. Uh, even the, the whole idea of the time of his coming is incredible to think about in regard to, the scripture says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, Galatians 4.4. 4. Uh, very interesting. And, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll hear people talk about, well, why, why didn't God, even with apologetics, the, the critics will say, well, why didn't God just reveal himself in these wonderful ways. Why do you wait so long to send Jesus? What, you know, all these kind of questions about questioning God's will, questioning God's purposes, questioning God's timing. And really, at the end of the day, what we're ultimately left with is say, well, in the fullness of time, God sent forth the Son. Okay? This, was, this was God's plan. This was God's timing. He chose to work in this way. And he can work that way, right? He's, he's sovereign. It's interesting, in the, in the Greek, there's a couple of words for, for time. Chronos, which we have chronology. Okay? This is a time which is counted. Okay? So we look at our watches, our calendars. Um, this is chronological time. And then there's kairos, the right time, uh, an opportune time. 
such as used in John 13 and verse 1. It's a time which is pregnant with meaning. The, the very important opportunity, moment in the chronological time, if you will. Well, chronos became kairos in Christ. At the incarnation of Christ, this was something incredible which occurred. The kairos took place in chronos. And this is why church history is a theological discipline. Uh, it is connected to Christ and the purposes of God in human history. Well, Jesus came into the world in a, in a, in a particular place in the midst of the powerful Roman Empire. The, the power of Rome intersected the life of Christ in numerous ways. We see this in, in the Bible. Herod attempted to kill Jesus is a baby, remember that account? Well, that's, that's the Roman Empire exerting its, its power. Uh, as a young child, he would have probably seen hundreds of crucifixions in the place in which he lived. Matthew was a tax collector, and, and Jesus had many dealings with, with other tax collectors. He healed a Roman centurion servant. He spoke of rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's. And so all this intersection and interplay with, with the Roman Empire, and, and through it all, he declares himself to be the Messiah. He made himself equal with God, according to the Scripture. So Jesus is central to history, and, and when we get to the, to the Bible courses and theology courses, we'll flesh this out a bit more. But we need to understand that even with church history, Church history is a theological discipline and is based on Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it should be Christ-centered. It should be Christ-focused. Because that's what this is, is all about. But there was, it's important to understand that there was a historical context that Jesus was born into, which helps us to understand the beginnings and the development of church history. So, so I'm, I'm beginning to make the connection here. We have to lay a little bit of groundwork to make the connection, which is, is going to make more sense, hopefully, as we begin to flesh this out, moving through the, the first century into the, into the second century. Uh, of course, there is the Jewish culture, which uh, Jesus lived in the midst of. And, and geographically, and there was a, a certain context to this. The, the Jews had a strong culture, a very strong culture. They'd been a conquered people for a long time. Many different kingdoms ruled over them. And, and there, many of them are spread all over the world because they were conquered and they were spread. But, but there were many synagogues and many cities in, in the Roman Empire, and they were especially united by the temple and the law. So they, so they, they had some unity, they had this strong culture. And, but it's important for us to understand that Palestine was multicultural in many senses of that word. I mean, we, we read the scripture and we see all Judaism, it seems, in, in the Gospels. And we're reading that and we saw all this Jewish background. It's just to, so to our mind, everything is Jewish in that area in which Jesus lived. Um, but that's not a correct picture of their culture of that day. There were somewhere around two million people who occupied their land, and there was a great diversity in regard to their politics and in regard to their religion. Bruce Shelley says, In the holy city of Jerusalem, Jewish priests offered sacrifices to the Lord of Israel, while at Sebast, only 30 miles away, pagan priests held rites in honor of the Roman god Jupiter. The Jews represented only half the population. They were an occupied people. They were spread out all over the world, but the world had come to them as well and were, were living in their land. This is why there's such tension that we see in, in the Scripture with the, between the Jews and the Romans, and we see especially fleshed out in the, in the more secular sources that we're, we're going to see how it really um, showed itself later. Um, but this is why. 
They're an oppressed people. They hate their oppressors. They hate the Roman Empire. Um, the Romans were representatives of a hated way of life, as Bruce Shelley puts it. And so the Jews tended to resist them in different ways. They, they couldn't agree on how to resist them, but they, they, they wanted to resist them at every turn they could. And so there, there's all kinds of different groups among the Jews. There's the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, the Essenes, and all of this plays into things. So there's this, there's this Jewish culture, but there's also a Greek culture that existed. And this is helpful to understand as well as we, we study history and church history. The Greek culture brought this intellectual contribution, which is primarily seen in the influence of their language. Uh, Alexander the Great, when he came and conquered, and he conquered uh, essentially the known world of that day, took the Greek language to the civilized world. Um, someone said the conquest of Alexander had an ideological basis. That is, he did not simply wish to conquer the world, but to unite it by spreading the insights of Greek civilization. Okay, so, you know, his civilization, civilization is going forth. His, I mean, we have the New Testament written in Greek, in that language. Why? Because that was the common language of the day. Um, so there was this, this sort of cultural renaissance, known as Hellenism. Okay, you may have heard of, of Hellenism. Well, Hellenism is really the blending of, of Greek culture with Eastern motifs, with Eastern ideas. And Alexander the Great is really the one who set this in force. When it came to the Jews, there were Hellenistic Jews. Well, what did that mean? Well, these were Jews who were influenced by the Greek culture. And, and they tended to live in separate communities. They spoke Greek. They used the Septuagint, which the Septuagint is the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures. So the, the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, as we could call them, were translated into the Greek language. And uh, so they would, they would use that. It's used a lot by the New Testament writers as well when they, when they quote. But, but these, these Hellenistic Jews tended to, to mix more easily with the Gentiles and with their culture. And, and we're going to see why this is important uh, in, a, in just a minute. And then there is the Roman culture. Well, Rome became known as the um, universal empire, became known for its law. Uh, primarily its political influence. The, the Romans were a conquering people. They were a warrior race. Tacitus, the historian, says they were the insatiable robbers of the world. <laughs> but they were civilized warriors. It's interesting. They were law-induced robbers, if you will. Law was very important to them. Order, very important to them. And again, you see this in the, in the New Testament. They conquered with might, but they ruled by law. So you had all these cultures coming together at this time and, and really influenced things. Well, uh, something dramatic happened. Um, in AD 66, things boiled over with the Jews in regard to the Roman Empire. Uh, Rome, you see, continually charged the Jews with unpaid taxes. And they said the Jews weren't paying their taxes, and they would often raid the temple treasury, and they would take the unpaid taxes. They would confiscate of the treasury what they ruled was, was theirs. They'd also sent Greek-speaking rulers to rule over the Jews, which the Jews did not like at all. And, and these rulers didn't have a lot of sympathy for the Jews. Um, well, this created greater and greater problems, and it created greater and greater debt among those outside of Jerusalem, especially the farmers and, and so forth. So it's just a lot of problems taking place culturally, socially, economically. Over the years, it's building up, it's building up. You know how it happens in, in cultures and societies. And, and this, is, this is what is happening with them. And then in AD 66, 
about 50 miles northwest of Jerusalem on, on the Mediterranean coast in the city of Caesarea, the revolt began. There was a, a local legal victory by Greek speakers, and they began to celebrate. And as they celebrated, they attacked the Jewish section of the city. And the Roman army, the soldiers stood by, did not intervene, while Jews were killed and murdered. Well, word got back to Jerusalem about this. And there was an immediate reaction. The Jews in the city attacked the Roman garrison that was there in Jerusalem and killed the Roman soldiers at the garrison. And the priests and other leaders began to revolt against the Romans as well. Seven years of war would follow. A terrible war. Dramatic and deadly. Devastating. At the beginning, the Jewish rebels did well. They held their ground. But it wasn't too long before four legions of Roman soldiers were brought in. Um, at their head was their great commander, Vespasian. And uh, the first thing he did was conquer the Mediterranean courts, ports and began to, to surround Jerusalem, press toward Jerusalem, cut Jerusalem off. Um, in the summer of 68, Nero, the emperor, died. And so Vespasian was elevated to be the Roman emperor. So he went back to Rome. So there was sort of a reprieve that took place there. You can, you can read all about this in Josephus, Jewish historian at the time, who, who accompanied all of this that was taking place and was able to write it down. Incredible reading uh, about this. So there's a little bit of a reprieve. Then Vespasian's son, Titus, took over the army and again began to press towards Jerusalem. And in April of AD 70, they began a siege against Jerusalem. The suffering was terrible. And in September, just a few months later, they finally entered the city, the Roman soldiers did, and the temple itself. And according to Josephus, Titus hoped to save the temple. Uh, other accounts make Titus guilty of actually burning the temple. Severus held that Titus wanted to destroy the temple in order that the Jewish, listen, and Christian religion might more completely be abolished. For although these religions were mutually hostile, they had nevertheless sprung from the same founders. The Christians were an offshoot of the Jews, and if the root were taken away, the stock would easily perish. But there was a problem with that approach, if that was the true approach and true motivation, there was a problem with that. And that is, uh, we're told at least by Eusebius, a, a church historian, early church historian, that all the Christians had already fled Jerusalem. And they went to Pella, uh, a town across the Jordan, and settled there. Why did they flee? Because Jesus had prophesied in Matthew 24 the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus had exhorted them to flee when they saw it coming. Christians saw it coming and they fled. Well, Jerusalem destroyed in AD 70. Massive, massive historical account in an event that took place. And, uh, and plays into understanding of church history. It plays into understanding of scripture. It plays into understanding of theology at that point. How, how you view that. But for three years, the Jews continued to fight. And, and then the rebellion was finally crushed at Masada. Uh, the, that great fortress, you can probably find a documentary about it, very interesting and, and sad as well, what happened there. They held out for the longest time, but then were finally uh, overtaken, and a number of them committed suicide instead of being captured by the Romans. Uh, well, um, in the meantime, Christianity is growing now, as, as a separate, separate from the Jewish context. This is very important for church history because now, and, and we'll see this a little bit more as we move along, but, but now 
Christianity has been separated from Judaism. And, and this is what helped to separate them was AD 70 in the destruction of Jerusalem. And in the future, what's going to happen is actually Rome is going to replace Jerusalem as the center of Christianity. Very fascinating. The center of the Roman Empire. So, <clears throat> what this brings us to is the spread of Christianity. Christianity began to spread, and it spread for a, for a number of reasons. Um, um, let me see if... Yeah. So the, so the spread of Christianity, here's, here's some of the reasons for, for that spread. First of all, the Roman peace. I told you the Roman Empire was important to understand this, the Roman context. Pax Romana, uh, the Roman peace. It had really been established by Caesar Augustus, who ruled from 27 B.C. to A.D. 14. And so he's the Caesar whenever Jesus comes incarnate. Um, well, this provided tremendous political and social stability to, the, to, to really the known world of that day. It made it very easy for ideas and for people to spread around the Roman Empire. There's trade routes, there's roads that are established, so you were able to travel in ways that you couldn't before, in, in incredible and marvelous ways, which you understand what that means for the spread of Christianity. Okay? People are able to travel with the gospel to the ends of the earth of that, of that known day, okay? known for that day. The second reason is the pervasive Hellenistic culture that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, and this accompanied the expansion of Roman political power. So you got the Roman culture and you got the Greek culture going forth at the same time. You got this, the Koine Greek, the common language of that day, the, the Greek language. It, it, it was available essentially to, to every somewhat educated person. They would be able to, to speak Greek um, in many, many cases. Um, and then there was the dispersion of the Jews from Judea. This is important for the spread of the gospel as well. Um, this had been going on actually for several centuries before the time of Christ, which meant that there were communities of God-fearers who studied the Hebrew Scriptures that were sprinkled throughout the Roman Empire. And so you see this whenever... Um, Paul goes forth into the new city. He goes to the, where first? Synagogue. To the Jew first, and then to the Greek or to the Gentile. Also at the same time, in, in this first century, uh, what we found from the study of history is that there was this widespread dissatisfaction with the, the religions that had existed around the, the Mediterranean. Um, so there's this dissatisfaction with the religions that were there, there's the Roman culture, which allows everybody to travel. There's the, the Greek culture, which uh, allows for affinity between people, especially in regard to the language. And then there's the Jewish culture spread everywhere, the dispersion of the Jewish synagogues throughout the Mediterranean, and, and which provided a base of operations for the Christian missionaries as they went forth. And, and that's why it's a, understanding this makes it a little bit more understandable for us how difficult it is sometimes to go into other lands with the gospel message. Lands where there's, there's been no Christianity, where there's been no Judaism. And, and to try to reinvent what the early church was doing in this incredible expansion and, and the foundation of churches all over the world in a very short amount of time, and in some cases, uh, biblically ordered and with mature people within a year's time leading those churches as elders, to try to replicate that is, is really not always fair for us to attempt to do that. I mean, I, for a long time, I, I wondered, how could it be that, that Paul would go on this missionary journey and come back, you know, a year later or whatever it might be, a little, bit, a little bit later, and he's appointing elders from these churches? How did these guys reach the maturity level that they did, their understanding of Scripture and these kind of things, so quickly? And we say, well, Holy Spirit worked in life... 
Well, you've got to remember, many of those were Jews. They knew the scripture. Some of them were priests. You know, they, there was already this foundation laid. Because God had allowed for the dispersion of the Jews into all these areas, it became much easier for the Christian missionaries to go forth and see a response, and which allowed them then to form churches that would then mature uh, very quickly in regard to the, the biblical order of things. Okay, we are just about out of time, but I want to want to hit on on one more thing. Okay, for just a couple minutes here, and then we'll come back and we'll we'll pick it up this time because I, I don't think we should separate this out from from what because right now it all sounds wonderful. You know, the the Christianity is spreading around the world in dramatic fashion. Just dr- incredible. You can look at some of that, go on the internet and look at some of the maps and some of the visual representations of how quickly Christianity spread. And, and you will see that it is quite astounding. But by the same token, as these Christians go forth, echoing no doubt in their mind are the words of Jesus. When he said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. They will deliver you up to councils, and in their synagogues they will scourge you. Yea, and before governors and kings, you shall be brought for my sake, for a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father his child. And children shall rise up against parents and cause them to put to death, be put to death. Can you imagine such a thing? And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, the very same conditions that allowed for the incredible spread of the gospel also brought opposition. There was not only Roman persecution, there was Jewish persecution. And this Jewish persecution took place in many different ways, in many different places, in many different times. And um, that is what I want us to stop with tonight. And then we'll pick up there, Lord willing, next time. And I want to stop there. I wanted to introduce that because I, I want us to be reminded that this is the testimony of church history. God's kingdom is going forth with great progress. But how does it go forth? It goes forth with suffering, and it goes forth with persecution. Over and over again, we see this in church history. From the very beginnings, we saw it, and we will continue to see it in our day as well, because that is the way of the kingdom of God spreading against the kingdom of Satan.